Well, thank you very much, Christine, for a very challenging uh, presentation. Um, well, I learned that uh, EU did not much for uh, refugees in Syria or Libya, um, did prepare the regional protection program that is meant to uh, keep away refugees from Europe, did not offer resettlement, but offered instead money, money for democracy, but also money for controlling borders, and that money for controlling borders can very easily become anti-democratic money. So we are in the midst of this, and uh, this is a very serious problem. So thank you for raising that issue. Uh, now we are going to, to continue and to move to Libya. So we are going to listen to uh, Amal Obeidi. Amal Obeidi is uh, a politist. She is professor uh, at the University uh, of uh, Benghazi in Libya. And she uh, started to uh, conduct uh, a survey on uh, migration in Libya after uh, the revolution, after uh, the, the fall of uh, the, uh, the old regime. And um, we are uh, very eager to listen to what uh, you are going to tell us about this. So please. And again, I'm sorry because time is absolutely flying. We have 45 minutes and we have uh, three uh, presentations. So please try to limit to 12 to 15 minutes, not more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, it's very difficult to talk about uh, a country. There are certain priorities which we have to, to talk about. Uh, the first thing is security. Uh, therefore, I think uh, uh, migration, which is part of security issue, I think in, in our uh, uh, leadership, it's, it's at the end of the list anyway, even with, with the Libyans uh, in general, or, or on the, uh, and the Libyan population. Uh, when I talk about the issue of migration, just to, to keep uh, the time, uh, 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 migration flows into Libya began in early 1960s. We, we know that, uh, especially after the discovery of the oil, mainly uh, from the neighboring countries like Egypt, Tunisia. In 1970s, also, we will find that uh, uh, Libya has been an important country uh, of immigration uh, within the framework of the international south-south uh, movements. Again, uh, an open door policy. Here there are lots of ideologies, ideologies by Gaddafi. He used the immigration as, as part of his foreign policies uh, uh, achievements. So we can see that the, uh, the open door policy was Im imposed by Gaddafi following the UN sanctions in 1992 and uh, targeted mainly the nationals of sub-Saharan countries uh, from Chad, Nigeria, Niger and many other countries and who started to enter Libya in large numbers. And then from Libya as a transit country, we know that uh, already they can make their way to Malta through this, to the certain cities in Libya like Zuara and move to Malta or to uh, 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 Lampedusa uh, in Italy. In 2007, Libya imposed visas on both Arabs and African, and I'm sure this has to do with the role of EU at that time through their negotiation to, the, uh, to Gaddafi's regime at that time. Uh, also, Libya uh, considered uh, also as an uh, important country for transit migration, especially for large numbers of migrants trying to reach Malta and the Italian Isles of Lampedusa. Libya has also never recorded significant outward uh, migration flows. However, currently, and due to the events uh, uh, last year, 2001, uh, uh, and I wish my colleague from Egypt and from Tunisia correct uh, the, the figure, uh, the, there's uh, estimation uh, or uh, the number estimated that 700,000 Libyans are in Egypt at the moment, and about 500,000 are in Tunisia and small numbers in Morocco and Nigeria and, and Algeria and many other countries, mainly are uh, al-Gaddafi's supporters. This is another issue. Uh, it has to do also with the, the issue of reconciliation, which is another uh, issue we have to talk about 
that we need another 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 uh, conference just to talk about this. Um, and just briefly, uh, I started uh, actually uh, conducting uh, research, and unfortunately, I didn't uh, finish yet because, as I mentioned, that uh, the, the the issue of migration is it's at the end of our of, of the list either for the Libyan population or for the uh, for the uh, the transitional government. However, I tried just to conduct through uh, um, uh, focus groups, and I tried also to uh, to follow certain uh, indicators. It showed that whether migration. Uh, we can we can do some work at least, uh, uh, and and I'm hoping that after the election, which is 7th of July, probably uh, we will move forward and to have more clear agenda in different issues. Uh, so since uh, here, uh, when I'm talking about the evaluation of the current situation, I'm talking here about the specific issue, which is the migration. Since last September, most Libyan refugee uh, in Tunisia and in Egypt have returned to Libya. Uh, Egypt uh, probably close to the, the former regime, and there are some, uh, as I mentioned, the figures or the numbers are st still remain in both countries, and there are certain uh, an at uh, attempts to, to, to have a reconciliation, at least to bring back uh, the, the, the children and the, uh, and the wives of certain uh, figures of the, of the Gaddafi supporters, but it seems that this wasn't received by the Libyan population, uh, and they... Uh, I think they accused uh, uh, certain figures of our uh, government uh, that, uh, while they, it's uh, those, uh, they were supporter of Gaddafi. They killed the Libyan people. Therefore, it's too early to talk about na national reconciliation, especially from this specific group. Most of the migration uh, who left the country during the crisis last year, they found their way to Libya. Figures are not uh, confirmed yet. Uh, for instance, uh, just. Last May, uh, I, I managed to visit one of these shelters, which is uh, uh, contain numbers of uh, migrants came from uh, either from Sudan or from uh, Egypt uh, through different and difficult ways. And I was listening to their stories. For instance, we I, I listened to uh, uh, four brothers from Bangladesh. Actually, they paid two thousand dollar to to uh, specific groups to take them to Sudan and then to, from. Sudan to uh, cross the Libyan border uh, in the south, mainly through Kufra, which is not very safe, and many other uh, border uh, areas uh, in the south, uh, which is uh, close to, to, to Sudan. Uh, there are lots of sad stories, actually. I mean, uh, anyway, so, uh, and there are some other figures which uh, uh, basically, uh, there are some uh, figures which I can't even rely, and this is one of the main problems that taking or conducting research and such issue uh, uh, even before. Uh, uh, one of the main challenges is the reliable uh, uh, statistical uh, or even information. Uh, so I think uh, one of the main, uh, at least this is one of the main uh, official uh, um, um, figures which uh, appeared uh, from the uh, Ministry of uh, Interior in Libya uh, during the January, uh, from January until April 2000. 12, uh, it showed that uh, 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 the migration according to cities, uh, Tripoli around uh, 1,200, uh, mainly Somalis, and uh, basically uh, their, their uh, center uh, of, or the shelter which usually they keep these groups is in Garyan. Uh, Tobruk around 850, mainly Egyptian, uh, Bangladesh, and Sudanese. Uh, in Derna city, 350. Uh, no information uh, about their background. Uh, in Benghazi, which is very interesting here, 3,100, uh, no information, but uh, uh, usually they uh, bring them uh, from the border as soon as they, ca they caught them and they bring them to these shelters. So uh, Benghazi, it seems, for these groups are more safe city, which I doubt. Recently, there are lots of incidents which showed that uh, it's not uh, stabilized, stable uh, city somehow. Uh, Kufra around 450, uh, mainly from Africa, 
and Asia, basically African and Asian, uh, um, uh, Girian, uh, which is uh, in the mountain, in the, basically in the, in the uh, uh, western mountain, around a thousand and a hundred, mainly African. As we can see, there is no specific uh, classification or identification for that. And that's just indicate how uh, Libyan government deal with, with, with such uh, issue. Basically, this uh, information comes from uh, uh, basically a group of civil society wh who are just recently established and they have some interest uh, in this uh, issue. So here I think we would say that civil society are doing uh, a lot regarding uh, this particular issue. And uh, on 17th of June uh, 2012, the uh, interim government created a, specif a, sp a special committee. This is the first time after probably the revolution, uh, at least officially, we heard apart from what has been uh, mentioned in our roadmap, which was presented in, in London conference last year. Uh, I think this is the only official action which has been made by our government, especially when they created a special committee uh, uh, con uh, contain num mem members of uh, or from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ministry of uh, Interior and Ministry of Justice. The mission of the com uh, the, this committee is to revise immigration uh, legislation and the agreements between Libya and the international community regarding this issue. The committee should submit its report within two weeks, which is actually uh, rather strange because such uh, a mission, I think, it, it takes uh, longer than that. At the same time, uh, uh, actually, in the same time, again, uh, nowadays we, we are uh, preparing ourselves for election and everybody busy with this specific issue, basically. Uh, and also there are some other issues like the, uh, the, the spreading, spreading of weapons and, and the fight between different tribes either in the south or in the in the western mountain uh, area so i think there are lots of issues can be talked about uh, and it seems this very very quick committee i don't know what kind of results of uh, and I, i'm actually very keen to know uh, 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 and to read the report if there is any report would come there the interesting thing that this committee uh, actually there is no mention of civil society or doing a lot regarding this uh, particular issue Again, uh, uh, and also the Ministry of Defense uh, here. As far as the public sphere is concerned, there is no debate in Libya about migration. People are focused on issues such as security, election, and some other economic and social issues. This was prov proven by a result of uh, a focus group which I conducted uh, just last month. Uh, uh, basically, the discussion uh, mainly uh, with the uh, university students, undergraduate, and postgraduate. So uh, basically uh, the, the preparation of some Libyan youth towards or the perception of uh, some Libyan youth towards migration, university students who are between 19 and 30 years, uh, migration for them was used by Gaddafi's regime as a, a threat to Europe. And, and again, uh, also was used by Gaddafi it's, uh, himself uh, in, during the war. And therefore I think there are lots of lots of uh, prejudice about this uh, and now probably uh, the people who came from uh, sub-Saharan uh, countries I think always targeted to be uh, abused or even to be uh, somehow uh, treated uh, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, difficult manner somehow it's, it's, uh, there are lots of uh, violation and abuse by, by certain groups because of, they think that these people they were part of, uh, of Gaddafi's uh, 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 troops at some stage. The group was divided actually. Some willing to leave Libya for a better opportunity and due to the lack of security and the uh, instability in the country. Part of the group preferred to remain in Libya and take part in the re the rebuilding the new uh, country or the new Libya. My final remarks regarding to this issue. Uh, numbers of challenges facing Libya. Migration is one of these challenges but not 
the one uh, or the main uh, in the in the main priorities at the moment. Among these challenges uh, are the following: uh, institutional vacuum and the process of the institutions building political parties, civil society. Uh, so here, the Libyan experience with these uh, political uh, institutions different from 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 the the experience in Egypt and and uh, and Tunisia. At least these countries they have their own uh, political institutions, unlike Libya. Uh, the role, the problem with the role of law, as we know that now, uh, one of the main problems, uh, uh, even our uh, uh, a transitional government always relies on, on the role of a tribe to, to, to have a role in reconciliation and even to, to, uh, to sort out some problems, uh, especially uh, in, in the South uh, uh, or any other groups in, in the country. Uh, democratic transition and ch uh, uh, changing uh, uh, of the political culture, this is another challenge uh, in Libya. Militarization and the security is another challenge, uh, transitional uh, issue and the, uh, uh, the process of national reconciliation, which is again another uh, challenge, not just between uh, uh, Libyan uh, inside the Libya at the moment and those who are uh, abroad, but again there are certain cities, they moved them from their uh, cities and now they are refugee basically within their own country, like uh, the problem between Misrata and Tawarga city. Uh, and it be, has been accused that the, the, the Tawarga uh, um, uh, citizens or population were part of the Gaddafi troops and they, they were convinced to many, uh, uh, they were accused uh, of, of doing lots of, uh, or uh, having lots of problems or attacking Misrata basically and raping women, raping women and all these kind of stories. So now I think they moved them out and they brought them and they, mainly these city are divided between uh, Tripoli and, uh, and Benghazi. Uh, transitional again, uh, challenges of rebuilding Libyan uh, economy and uh, rebuilding the uh, country. Uh, again, uh, despite the increasing of the role of the civil society in, in dealing with this issue, it seems that this group are lack of training and uh, capacity building, but uh, I think this is one of the main uh, challenges for this particular group to, to to, to be part of the uh, new Libyan uh, institutions. Uh, again, the problem has to do with the borders, lack of the border control, which is, uh, I think it has to do, this is, uh, it's not just uh, in Libya. Uh, I think there are lots of um, challenges regarding this issue and, and uh, such an open uh, border, uh, I think needs lots of support from many other countries. It's not just uh, a Libyan matter. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to stop here. Thanks a lot and uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Amal, for this uh, first-hand uh, uh, presentation on Libya. Uh, the situation is extremely interesting. Uh, rebuilding Libya, uh, which was a country relying heavily on uh, immigrant labor, will need probably migrants. And actually, migrants are back, as uh, you, you said. Um, and the administration is already reacting to that by constructing uh, shelters or detention centers and putting in place committees, one committee with a very beautiful name to filter and fight migration according to, to you, yeah. which is, I think, uh, telling a lot. And, um, uh, and that's it. Okay, thank you very much. So we now have only... Um, 30 minutes left for two presentations. Uh, now, Mohamed Olwan. Uh, Mohamed Olwan is professor of law in various universities in Jordan, uh, mainly, I would say, in Yarmouk universities, where you passed a large part of your career. Uh, Mohamed is Palestinian Jordanian and uh, uh, will uh, present, he did uh, a survey on uh, the uh, refugees from Syria in Jordan and another survey on the attitudes of young people in Jordan uh, today regarding immigration. 
And you are going, I think, to concentrate on the second survey, yeah. not on the, the Syrian refugees. So, <coughs> if you could Quickly. try to get, yes, in 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Philippe. Uh, and uh, my presentation is also based on uh, discussions among uh, focus groups and uh, interviews uh, with uh, different uh, categories of uh, people and uh, most uh, specifically young people. Uh, as you know, uh, Jordan uh, is both a sending and receiving country for uh, migration, not only forced migration as a, re uh, as a result of regional instability but also Jordan is a major receiver of labor migrants too, especially from Egypt and non-Arab Asian uh, countries. Arab uh, uprisings, uh, known also as the Arab Spring or Arab uh, Awakeness, uh, mark the occurrence of uh, significant uh, changes in the Arab region at all levels of uh, economy, politics, uh, security, and demography. Since Jordan is the uh, country closest to Syria in social and economic terms, it has seen a good deal of Syrian uh, migration since uh, 2011. Around uh, 120,000 Syrians, according to the Jordanian government. The number of Syrians registered with the High Commissioner for refugees, meanwhile, stood at uh, about 13,000 uh, uh, people at the end of May, to which must be added the new asylum-seeking uh, applications of up to uh, five applications, uh, uh, according to the UNHCR. UNHCR alone is entrusted uh, with the responsibility of determining who is refugee and who is not, and this is in accordance uh, with a memorandum of understanding uh, signed uh, between uh, Jordan and uh, the UNHCR in 1998. The number of Syrians uh, who come to Jordan is impressive considering that Jordan has fewer than 6 million citizens, with the refugee uh, Palestinians already uh, pre uh, uh, and uh, Iraqi, uh, Jordan becomes one of the first countries in the world in terms of the ratio of the number of refugees uh, compared to the total population. Additionally, in light of the Arab Spring, Jordan has become the destination of many uh, seekers of health services, uh, especially from uh, Yemen and uh, Libya. Furthermore, the situation in Egypt, uh, Syria, and Lebanon made Jordan due, due to its political stand a secure country for tourism, especially for Gulf countries. Now I come to the findings of uh, the uh, study. Participants were asked to uh, share their views on a number of issues and were specifically uh, asked, do you think uh, reform is coming to Jordan and that the government is doing its best to ensure political reform, economic growth, and social justice? The majority expressed a negative opinion. Many observed that they don't trust the reform process in the country, and those recent protesters in the streets uh, to claim reform are turning into discriminatory escalations. This is due uh, at their mind to the fact that Jordanians of Palestinian origin are not yet part of these uh, protests. The majority further stated that changing government so often is not helping. It is worth mentioning that Jordan governments have changed for three times over the last year. The geopolitical situations of Jordan has been raised too. It has been observed that being at the border with Israel and uh, any reform process is being under close observation by external power players with interest in the region and is meant to be limited. Corruption was discussed. The majority expressed dissatisfaction with the fact that the government is solving its financial problems caused by corruption by increasing taxes. We requested to sum up obstacles of reform uh, in one word. The obstacles were as follows. Educational system, corruption, lack of ethics, uh, absence of the rule of law, discrimination, lack of confidence in governments, etc.
On the question of effects of Arab Spring uh, on trends of uh, migration to and from uh, uh, Jordan, participants were asked to share their views at the Arab Spring and the majority agreed to the opinion that the Arab Spring could be seen positively where people will decide their own destiny and so their uh, home countries will be secure for living. However, foreign interference will impede the process. These there, there were many concerns uh, among the participants. The majority observed that deterioration of the economic situation in Jordan is due to receiving migrants on an escalating basis. Migration, both voluntary and forced, is being exploited, and so prices have increased to the extent that local income is insufficient to Jordanians. The, so the social aspect has been influenced. Some uh, observed that the identity of Jordanian society is changing rapidly. Some further stated that foreign migrants and refugees commit robberies a claim that has no credible basis. In response, some suggested that this is due to their situation, while others did not justify uh, this and stated that Jordanian society itself is not ideal to demand, to demand idealism. idealism. On the question, do you consider immigration from Jordan, the majority stated that they want to migrate. Some of the interviewees stated that they have no future in Jordan. On the question, did your perception change before and after Arab Spring? The majority observed that they always wanted to immigrate before and after the Arab Spring. This is due to the deteriorating economic and social situation in Jordan. However, even though most of them observed that the world is witnessing an economic crisis. On the question, uh, if you consider immigration, what are your reasons? The general perception is that the West is not ideal, as many of the respondents have had experiences in different countries in the West. Nevertheless, they still prefer to immigrate to the West. On the question, is your wish to immigrate linked to what you uh, know about others' experiences? Most of the respondents observed that the experiences of others and their uh, own do not make countries of destination ideal. Then again, one can start from uh, uh, scratch abroad, work hard and achieve something. Whereas inside of Jordan, one cannot achieve anything, no matter how he or she works, due to many factors, namely corruption and discrimination. On the question, what are the motives behind your desire to uh, immigrate, most of the respondents stated that the main mo motive is improving their economic conditions, others stated uh, uh, education. On the question of the country of destination, while a couple of respondents observed that they are willing to immigrate to any country other than Saudi Arabia, a couple of respondents expressed their will to move back to their home country. One Egyptian worker who is working in Jordan at present and one uh, Jordanian of Palestinian origin uh, graduate who wants to go back to Palestine. Holland, Sweden and UK were some of the choices, in addition to Tunisia, as revolution is now over and the country is working uh, in a context of reconstruction by its own people. Moreover, uh, one respondent stated that she does not wish to immigrate because she belongs uh, uh, strongly to Jordan. On the question, do you uh, have enough information about the country of destination, some of the respondents who have been uh, to foreign countries have good perception about the country of destination and the goal they are looking to achieve, while some do not have the, sli the slightest idea about the country of destination, but believe Jordan will kill their future, so they want to move regardless of the consequences. On the, on the question of the length of the duration of of, uh, immigration, uh, half of the respondents stated that they want to get back to Jordan after spending a considerable period of time abroad, while the other half emphasized that they don't wish to return to Jordan. Most of the respondents observed that they want to return back to their home countries and be able to move legally. Therefore, they will use legal means of immigration, while very few of them stated that they do not mind uh, the, the, these means 
uh, if uh, uh, there is uh, uh, if there is no other uh, ways on the question of integration in the country of destination most of the respondents observed that the main challenges are cultural uh, shock and language barrier however both can be dealt with by time some respondents stated that they have more religious freedom abroad than in Jordan on the question of the benefit of return to the home country while while some respondents observed that they will benefit the country with experiences gained abroad some others are Argued that foreign countries which receive migrant workers depend on their expertise in the first place and that the migrants adds value to the country of destination in return to the provision of services. One respondent stated that immigration will decrease population condensation in Jordan and so is positive. Most respondents observed that they will contribute to development projects in uh, Jordan. Last question now. Do you consider uh, re uh, returning to Jordan if your children grow to a certain age? Most of the respondents stated th their uh, de decision to return or stay is not mainly based on their children. They further observed that parents can adjust their children's upbringing. However, some respondents stated that they will return if they have female children if the girl is 10, while male children can wait until the, uh, they reach 18 years old. This is because a female uh, is uh, ought to, to mature in a reserved community rather than one of different culture. It is significant indicator of the gender inequity uh, problem and the honor shame complex where only a female could defile the family's honor. It is deep rooted to the extent that different experiences and exposure uh, to other cultures uh, renders it uh, uh, insolvable. Uh, I stop here. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Mohammed, for this presentation on Jordan, which is a very paradoxical country, the country number one for refugees in the world, mm -hmm. and also a country from where every young people want to emigrate. So Seems. that is uh, <laughs> that is something uh, uh, very uh, interesting. So uh, now our last uh, presenter will present on Islam, I suppose. In, uh, <laughs> in, but let me first introduce Olivier Roy. Olivier Roy is. Uh, I thought it was on. Olivier Roy is a professor of political science here at the European University Institute. He holds the Mediterranean chair. Uh, Olivier Roy is a, a, a well-renowned scholar on issues of religion, Islamism. He works uh, in many universities and also a lot with the media. Well, uh, it belongs to uh, this um, um, intelligentsia, uh, no border uh, intelligentsia, and we are very happy to have Olivia DUI. So please, your um, comments on the Arab Spring and migration. Donc, par solidarité avec le. As out of solidarity to the south of the Mediterranean, I'm going to be speaking French. And I'm going to speak for only 12 minutes, and I'm going to speak of everything. The relationships between Europe and the authoritarian regimes in the Arab world were justified essentially by issues of security. That was the excuse they always gave. Security was immigration, terrorism, and Islamism. Now, this system, which had been in existence for 30 years, doesn't work anymore. And uh, it's not a question about the uh, Arab Spring translating into uh, Arab winter or a Berber Spring. It's not a question of that. It's not that system doesn't work and will not continue to work. There are new situations that are very complicated. And we can see what uh, we heard about Libya. Um, there was a movement of populations, but there are no rules. When a strong regime controls 
immigration, migration and the, the fact that a uh, weak regime does not control it, this doesn't, this, this is not true. There is no stability, but there are also the Nardat, the uh, Egyptian army is still an interlocutor in Libya. There are many interlocutors and so on. And then there are new rules of the game to be found. Which ones? There's no longer the great doctrine that uh, you that can encompass uh, Islam, migration, and so on. At the same time, uh, isn't this a mistake to keep thinking uh, using the old categories of challenge? I will examine them one by one. Migration. Well, we know that today we have to speak more about mobility than migration, in particular for Arab countries. We're no longer in a period of mass movements of people who go to Europe to look for a job. We forget about returns or simply circulation, uh, circulatory migration. Young people from Arab countries who go to France and then go back to their country of origin to create an enterprise. They keep a double nationality. They have business with France. Um, and so it's, it's a circular movement. And a lot of our leaders have not understood this this shift from migration to mobility. Then terrorism. Well, most of the terrorists arrested in Europe were born in Europe. Maybe they have a Muslim origin or they converted to uh, Islam, but they were born in Europe. Uh, they're not necessarily linked to nomadism, to migration and so on. Well, Akadam may decide to have headquarters or seats in uh, Mali. Uh, this is not uh, yet true. But there are no people who cross the Mediterranean to go and uh, uh, commit suicide under the uh, Eiffel Tower. Um, terrorists are born in Europe. Now, coming to Islam, well, all the Muslim brothers are now our discussion partners. So you may, you may like them or not like them. Uh, you may agree with them or not. It doesn't matter. They are our discussion, discussion partners, and we have to talk to them. Uh, the, the Tunisian Interior Minister is uh, um, a Muslim and we're going to talk to him. The same happens uh, to Egyptian ministers uh, in Syria. Members of government uh, are Muslims and we talk to them. So this is a fait accompli. Uh, so what, what is going on? There are three main obstacles to the democratization of Arab countries. Uh, democratization doesn't work when there's a strong army, Yemen, Syria, Egypt. Uh, it doesn't work uh, when there is uh, income from oil, uh, Algeria, Saudi Arabia. Uh, you don't see democratization there. Uh, Iran is another example. For a simple reason, uh, authoritarian governments Cor try to corrupt society in a way. Uh, they use the security forces, police forces. Uh, uh, they have a strong army that they use in order to uh, apply security to channel uh, people's movements in the direction they want. And then there are also geostrategic constraints uh, that uh, act as obstacles uh, to democratization. Uh, regardless of the type of government in Tunisia, it will fall within the same geostrategical framework. Um, and the, the relationships with Libya will be complicated. The relationship with Italy will be focusing on Lampedusa. But the whole of this tends to a framework of stability. Whereas uh, if a democracy triumphs in Bahrain, well, that that means that the geostrategic situation in the Gulf region will change because the majority is Saya 
and uh, therefore it is seen with suspicion by uh, the Saudi Arabia and so on. They are accused of being faithful to Iran. But this is not true. We see that in Syria today. Everybody blames Syria and why? because with the dis disappearance of the regime of Bashar al-Assad, uh, there is a, a geostrategic landslide earthquake, uh, and uh, people fear the um, rise of Hezbollah, for instance. So this, uh, these are obstacles to democratization. Now we have to take into consideration these new players on the scene, Islamic players. Because amongst the security motivations, there is the fear of uh, uh, Islamists. But the concept of uh, the Islamic revolution is over in the Arab world for the time being. And why? Not necessarily because Islamists have turned into Democrats or Christian Democrats or Muslim uh, Democrats, and they're no longer Christian Democrats, not even in Italy. So this is an option that is no longer available. But they no longer have, or they never had, the monopoly of representation of religion in the political arena. And this is something important, because the political leg legitimacy of uh, Islamists was saying, uh, Islam in politics, it's us. This is what the Muslim brothers have been saying for 60 years. And what do we see today? They have a di they are, there's a different uh, religious configuration. They have the Salafites who have uh, erupted in the uh, political arena. And we see that in Tunisia with the, the, the Nadat and the Salafites are com conflicting. And there are other religious forces uh, that are emerging and they r are denying to give a monopoly to extremist groups. Uh, for instance, the University of Al-Azhar that is asking to separate political institutions from religious institutions, which is uh, something of interest to us. A second point, Islamists, even when they gain power through elections, they cannot control at the same time the state uh, um, apparatus and the army. Uh, the army is not a, a democratic uh, institution. It's not. Uh, it doesn't guarantee a, a secular uh, government. But the Muslims have got into a democratic rationale. That is to say, they want to extend the vote, the number of voters. And this has made them abandon a little bit the previous ideology. Third point, the voters of the Islamist parties are conservative people. Uh, they're not revolutionaries. Uh, they want stability. They want good governance. And they also want tourism. Uh, and tourists to, co to come back to their countries were no longer in the situation of Iran in, in, the, in the 70s. And then these new rules of the games are imposed on everybody, including the Islamists, uh, even if uh, they would like not to be imposed to those rules. That means that they are subjected to good governance and elections. Islamists in Tunisia and in Egypt uh, have lost their popularity in six months, uh, basically 50% for the Muslim brothers. And why? Uh, because uh, for six months, they've only been speaking about Islam and Sharia. And people don't want that. They want good governance. Um, they are in favor of Islam and Sharia, but this is something different from good governance. And this is what they want. Uh, so it, it's a failure, as a matter of fact. Uh, I will conclude by saying the, the new political framework uh, that uh, has emerged uh, in the Arab world includes and reshapes uh, everyone, including the Islamists. Uh, so they are obliged to live within a framework, a political framework that is not ideological, ideologically democratic, but is based on elections, uh, uh, parliament, and constitutions. Uh, and this is what, this is the game they have to play with. Thank you very much, Olivier.
I don't know whether you've drawn the conclusions or we're going to have a question and answer session as well, but very interesting because you have shown that the security focus to policies of Europe is based on categories that are obsolete. Uh, immigration has been replaced by mobility. Terrorism is now born in Europe. Islamism is now uh, running these states. So how those, all this is tied to migration? Well, maybe we could uh, have uh, further uh, study on this. We take some questions and we try to have answers, but we have only one minute left according to, uh, to, to uh, the agenda. So uh, maybe we could just postpone a little bit the coffee break until uh, until uh, 4.55 uh, or something like that. So questions, but be very, very, very concise, please. <laughs> Catherine. Yes, hello, I'm Catherine from the MPC. I have a question for Ibrahim and then one for Zubir. Ibrahim, you mentioned that uh, in the wake of the, uh, the revolution that there has not been at least a, a significant increase. There has been a perception of a significant increase on the part of the, the cops, but this has not been demonstrated. I was curious about in the case of women, because I've read that the state of gender democracy in Egypt has greatly deteriorated. The state of gender democracy has greatly deteriorated. And I wondered if there was any anecdotal evidence, not any statistical, but any anecdotal evidence about whether there has been an increase of women seeking to migrate, uh, Egyptian women. And the second question was for uh, Zubir. I'm curious to, to see what the returnees, where are they integrating into the economy? So when they return from Spain, crisis uh, racked Spain, are they returning to the previous occupations? Are they becoming entrepreneurs? What exactly uh, are they doing when they go back? Thank you. Another question? Yes, please. Um, hello, my name is Mariam, and I have a question from Ms. Christian. You mentioned several times the, the word democracy, and um, I was born in Iran and grown up in the Middle East, f living my life with two, within two wars, and it's not just my story, it's lots of us. I have the question that if we phrase the word democracy and freedom uh, in this term that uh, be, like US or Euro European Union are giving money to countries like Libya, like Libya to, to support them to have democracy. I think we should rephrase the word because um, considering the, the recent attack of uh, NATO supported by French aircraft, and uh, their immediate uh, access to the, to the oil in Libya. And also, it, it, it didn't just happen to Libya, it happened to my country, Iran, in 1953. And also, when Saddam Hussein stopped trading oil with dollar, and also the same happened to Gaddafi. So, uh, and I'm wondering if it's a real uh, democracy approach, why it doesn't happen to people in Syria, which they don't really have oil, but lots of people are killed there, but I don't see that uh, they, are, they are having this kind of support to have democracy. So um, I would really appreciate it if you uh, tell me what kind of democracy and freedom it's going to be. Thank you. Sorry? I'm sorry. What was the last part? What, what, what uh -huh. was the last part? What countries are... I, 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 I ended my uh, question with, I would appreciate if you tell me that what kind of democracy and freedom w would be through these policies in these countries which I brought their name and examples. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have one and a half question for both Zubi and Hassan. So in French, um both of you spoke about uh, the questioning of relationships between Tunisia and Morocco and the European Union. Zubir, you spoke a lot about uh, this claim for dignity uh, that is questioning uh, these relationships, uh, is questioning visas, also visas imposed uh, in the countries of origin. But I wonder whether there are not also claims uh, 
that would be addressed to the government to change the migratory policies and their legislation on migration, and in particular, for instance, uh, eliminating and abolishing this crime of illegally getting out of the country. I wonder whether there are not also these types of claims uh, besides uh, um, blaming Europe. And I wonder whether there is a debate on the reform on the rights of foreigners. I know that there's some pressure for in these countries for changes in legislation. I'd like to to know whether this claim aims at improving the rights of migrants. Um, and also, I am under the impression there's not much debate about uh, the issues that affect uh, the nationals, uh, the citizens of the countries of origin, apart from uh, abolishing the crime of getting out of the country. A question for Olivier. Isn't there a specific political agenda that is emerging inside uh, Islamist parties uh, about uh, migratory policies? And if yes, uh, what is the ideological basis for these new migration policies and which are the priorities of these Islamist parties? And for Christine? multinational remittances and I was wondering uh, how much these, this concept that has been much developed by, the, by many scholars and the literature uh, fits with um, I mean comments from I think Zubir and uh, Ibrahim Awad on uh, migrants actually voting for Islamist party mainly voting for Islamist parties I mean migrant abroad voting in the election of their country of origin for Islamist parties uh, thank you any, any other question? So, I think that we can give the floor to those who want to... Yeah, Ibrahim. Uh, uh, I'd like to start by commenting something that uh, was not raised as an issue, and I'd like to express my t complete agreement with what Olivier Roy said. And I believe this is something important because uh, at times uh, when uh, uh, specialists in politics uh, from uh, Arab or uh, Egyptian countries uh, make the same analysis, they're not believed. Uh, because uh, people believe that uh, we're too optimistic, uh, we're simplistic, uh, we're naive, uh, we perform wrong analysis, but I think that uh, the analysis we listen to is correct, and it's not only a question of democratization. It is also the circumstances that uh, impose democratization to Islamists and the reorganization and redistribution of uh, uh, political power in these countries uh, has an impact. Uh, the Salafites were mentioned uh, and uh, uh, what uh, the professor said is right. And uh, the essential issue here is that uh, the secular Arab people are not against religion and uh, they have followers uh, and therefore there's less support uh, to Islamists and Islamic parties. Uh, so it's a little bit complicated as an issue, more complex that it may appear at face value. Now, uh, to women, whether women um, wish to migrate, and I use the word wish to migrate more than, than others, in fact, I do not know. I do not know because uh, um, we have we've done a very, very, very uh, sort of uh, small study that you cannot really infer from the study whether uh, women have more uh, wishes to migrate or not. However, uh, the question really is that even if you have women who want to migrate, how many women? What's the percentage of women who will be able to migrate? It's exactly like the question of employment. How many workers will be able to migrate? The solution of the women question or of the employment question does not lie in migration. 
And this is, in fact, what is important in the analysis, that the regimes or the political systems that do not bring responses to questions of employment or migration will not be able to sustain themselves because migration is not the solution. Now, the question of women has suffered for something quite interesting. The women movement uh, before, before February 2011 in Egypt was split in two. The old women movement that started at the beginning of the 20th century, this was the, the civil society movement, the movement which was not seen in the media, and then the movement that was appropriated by the regime and was un in the television and in, in the press. The movement that in Egypt was appropriated by the wife of the president. By identifying the women question with the wife of the president, the women cause uh, 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 suffered uh, uh, tremendously. So the question now is that you see the other women movement reappropriating re the questions of women, and they are resisting, and they are withstanding the pressures of the more, the more conservative. In fact, in spite of everything that has been said around, and in, fight, in spite of, 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 of the need to be vigilant, in fact, Nothing has changed in the legal structure so far. So I think this is a question of political, political, uh, 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 political bargaining, political uh, fight, and I think that the reappropriation of the movement is in the direction of democracy and of uh, of, of of plurality. Uh, I will. Uh, I think I'll stop here. Uh, you had another question, but we'll we'll talk we'll talk later. Yes. Maintenant, donc, je je passe la parole. And now the floor to Hassan. One minute, please, Hassan. Very quickly to answer two points. First of all, as I said, I think that uh, Tunisia is actually full of works in progress in the field of migration, not just externally, but also internally. A law on asylum seekers is being discussed and being drafted right now together with the UNHCR and with the Ministry of Justice. That's the asylum seekers law. Secondly, there has been a proposal for all laws on uh, border circulation of foreigners and Tunisians should be revised in order to remove discriminations against foreigners. As for the poli policy aspects of I, I wrote this in the full version of the report. I've said this. All political parties have programs on base, focused on Tunisians living abroad. But this depends on the party as to what the content of their programs are. The rights of Tunisians living abroad for some, peop some parties envisage them being allowed to vote in the national elections and others don't, and so on. So far, one of the parties, my way of propaganda, has said, we're going to take care of your children. Your, if, unless you come back, your children are not going to be able to emigrate to follow you because we've paid for educating them. Now, return migration deserves uh, m more detailed studies. Uh, it's a phenomenon that has been going on for 10 years, but it wasn't uh, visible in the past. It's now become visible because uh, I visited various uh, migration areas, uh, and we see these return migrants who are opening bars. Uh, uh, they start uh, their own businesses, uh, uh, but... Uh, there's no study that has been uh, carried out yet. We don't know whether they're going to stay or they're going to leave. Maybe this is part of a circular movement. A lot of them have uh, also come back with their families. Uh, and 
this might also be due to the crisis in Europe. And so they have become visible. In the last decade, we have seen the return of young people with degrees, people with the capital to invest, people who have acquired the entrepreneurship culture from Europe. But there are also other categories of people who come back to the con their country of origin due to the crisis. Uh, I had interviews with them and they say returning is a way of avoiding hogra, so the humiliation of being in a foreign country. Coming to elections, I believe that uh, the the Justice and Democracy Party succeeded in putting together 100,000 people in Madrid. I don't know whether any other party was able to do the same. So uh, they have really a strategy towards uh, Moroccans abroad who represent 10% of the population and who will have the right to vote. They're going to vote. And this is something that is going to totally change the configuration of, poly of uh, the political scene in Morocco. That was all. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. All right. <laughs> I think you made an extremely important point. Um, what kind of democracy can really form when you have the national security interests of the United States being played out through the world? Like you said, in 1953, it overthrew Mossadegh. And now in Egypt, it's providing $1.3 billion. It just reinstated its military funding to Egypt. It's funding the rebels in Libya. The CIA is funding the rebels in Syria. And so I don't know what kind of democracy is possible at this point, but I think that that was my speculation. That was what I was proposing to see what can happen from the exchange of migrants to Europe as opposed to going to places like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, places like this. So, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> this was a very long session. But, uh.